<laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Mark Madison, the historian at the National Conservation Training Center. And today I'm very fortunate to be with Tracy Lesky, who's going to give a talk tonight to us on the spotted lanternfly. The official title of the talk, written by a scientist, is <laughs> Quantifying the Threat Posed by and developing sustainable solutions for invasive spotted lanternfly. And Dr. Lesky uh, currently works at the USDA Agricultural Research Service Appalachian Fruit Research Station mm -hmm. nearby in Carneysville, West Virginia. She actually has many accolades. She's been on <laughs> C-SPAN, CNN, but her most famous contribution mm -hmm. is she set an all-time record here at NCTC <laughs> for our public lecture series. Many years ago, uh, she brought in about 350 people in an auditorium that holds about 200 <laughs> <laughs> to learn about the uh, stink bug invasion we had. Yeah. So she's she's on the invasive circuit, basically. So Tracy, we're so happy to have you here. Thank you, Mark. And, yeah. you know, since we've had you here for two invasive species, right. was this always your area of interest as an entomologist? Um, solving problems caused by insects was really and has always been my interest but invasives have really taken over my career since about 2009. Prior to that I was working with a lot of native insect pests that we have that attack things like peaches and apples. So prior to this mm -hmm. I knew you via the brown marmorated stink bug. Correct yes. me if I got the name you wrong. You did. You did it perfectly. <laughs> well, you taught us well. And uh, this last year we had the spotted lanternfly mm -hmm. outbreak. Uh, what are some of the similarities and some of the differences between those two invasives? Sure. So some of the similarities are that they both are um, similar in that they have piercing sucking mouth parts. So basically a long straw that they use to feed on plant fluids. A difference is that lanternflies feed on uh, plant sap, the phloem, okay. whereas brown marmorated, you know, you'd find them on your tomatoes and on your apples, feeding directly on the fruit. They both actually um, come from China, but how they arrived is probably quite different. Um, lanternflies probably came in on a shipment of stone as egg masses. They overwinter as egg masses. Okay. Whereas uh, brown marmorated stink bug, as probably everybody knows, uh, like to overwinter as adults in anything. And so they probably came in on a shipment of goods as adults. Are we seeing more invasives or are we just more aware of them? Um, well, certainly with global trade, um, invasives happen, I mean, for, for better or for worse. But I do think we are doing a better job at educating um, the public and having more outreach so that when something new shows up, people become aware of it and we're better at detecting it earlier. Now, you guys are working to control the invasive problem as a federal agency. Right. For invasive insects, is there anything individuals can do to try to control them? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think if you have them, you know, the way I look at it, they don't belong here. They are not native. So feel free to annihilate any you encounter <laughs> in your yard. Right. Um, people do scrape the egg masses of spotted lanternfly. And they also, um, you know, you'll see uh, campaigns for squishing lanternflies. There even is an app you can, like, play along and see how many you squish relative to... <laughs> some friends you have on this app. So, I mean, it may not, you know, crash the population, but it's one fewer than we had previously. So that's one thing. Another is to be conscious of things like Tree of Heaven, an invasive tree species. And, you know, it's hard to get rid of, but if you can, that will help because in fact, both of those species like to feed on it. Okay. Yeah. So let me ask you this, for insects in particular, mm -hmm. is there any way for invasive insects to be completely eradicated or are you working mostly to contain them? So, um, yes, there, the goal, usually, you know, when, when invasives come in, the goal is often to try to eradicate the pest. And so there was a major effort and it's still going on to try to eradicate lanternfly. And so um, our sister agency, APHIS, makes mm -hmm. those kinds of decisions. Okay. Mm -hmm. What gets you jazzed about your work? Oh, all the weird behaviors that we observe from insects. <laughs> One of the weirdest that we've noticed with lanternfly that I find very entertaining, but also just interesting is that, you know, when, and if you've encountered spotted lanternflies, they're strong jumpers. They'll yeah. jump long distances. Well, when um, the nymphs jump, 
they're like a gymnast in the air. They're doing a tumbling routine, and they always land on their feet. And I find that very interesting. <laughs> they're like cats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, sometimes we're looking at those kinds of weird behaviors and seeing if we can exploit them in some way. Um, for example, lanternflies like to feed on Tree of Heaven, but they and they also like to just kind of hang out there. So can we create a scenario where we can create an attractive hillside around Tree of Heaven? So we, we study in behavior and we study it to manipulate that behavior. Do you have an early warning system when insects are first detected that might be invasive? Does this come from academics, other it, scientists? It, all of the above, okay. honestly. Um, sometimes it's an academic at a university. Sometimes it's uh, APHIS that finds something. Um, and so we will uh, get kind of reports, you know, from, that, hey, this insect has been sighted in this area. There's now a quarantine in place, meaning trying to restrict movement. Um, and so, and, and, and we'll be told to be on the lookout for it. And it was the same with lanternfly here when, when it first was detected in Pennsylvania. Last question. Sure. Are there any other insects that we should be aware of on the horizon that you're using? Um, Currently, there's nothing that's close. Um, we, we've been battling another invasive fly known as spotted wing drosophila, and that is already present here. People may not recognize it, but this is a pest of um, small fruit like blueberries and strawberries and things like that. So we've been working with that pest as well. It's, the, it's a drosophila, so it's tiny, and it looks just like every other drosophila, but, you know, from the naked eye. So, um, so those are really our pestiferous, we'll say, invasives that we're dealing with locally, but nothing quite on the horizon. Great. Yes. Tracy, we're very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you for this time. We You're really welcome. appreciate it. Okay. Well, it gives me great pleasure to invite back to NCTC uh, Dr. Tracy Lesky. We've been doing this lecture series for 27 years, the Conservation Lecture Series, and Tracy has attracted the biggest audience by far ever in our history. She brought in about 350 people. If you look around, this auditorium does not hold that many people, so we had to go to another auditorium uh, when she came many years ago to talk the, about the brown marmorated stink bug. She continues to help us battle invasive insects. Dr. Lesky holds a PhD in entomology from the University of Massachusetts. Currently, she's employed by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Agricultural Research Service at the Appalachian Fruit Research Station nearby in Carneysville, West Virginia. She has uh, appeared on NPR, C-SPAN, CNN, uh, all over the place, but I still like to think her most successful public appearance ever was in this very auditorium many years ago. So please give a very warm NCTC welcome to Dr. Tracy Lesky. Well, good evening, everyone, and here I am again talking about another invasive species, but I'm really delighted to have all of you here so I can update you on what we've learned about the threat posed by the invasive spotted lanternfly, as well as some of the sustainable solutions we are working on with my lab group and my colleagues around the country. So to get started, um, Spotted lanternfly is classified as an invasive species because of the ecological and economic harm it has the potential to inflict. Now, this species is native to China, India, and Vietnam, but before it arrived in the U.S., it actually was invasive in South Korea and Japan. Uh, when it arrived in the U.S., that occurred back in 2014, when it first showed up in Berks County, Pennsylvania, um, and it likely came in on a shipment of decorative stone from China. And so when um, the State Department of Ag in Pennsylvania found this pest, they immediately uh, put a uh, quarantine in place as well as a mitigation plan to try to reduce the spread and potentially eradicate. So this map on the right um, shows the spread in Pennsylvania. They didn't stop the spread, but they did slow it down. 
And so much of Pennsylvania is now infested. And if you look at the current distribution, um, you can see it spread well beyond Pennsylvania. We have them in West Virginia, Virginia, Delaware, uh, Maryland, New Jersey, up into New York, then some of the New England states. And we even have populations as far west as Iowa, um, Chicago, and Detroit. So this insect continues to spread. So my first encounter with spotted lanternfly came in 2017 when my colleague Julie Urban, who is at Penn State in the Department of Entomology, asked me to come and take a look at this new invasive species that was starting to spread in eastern Pennsylvania. So these pictures were taken in late October. And so you see the numbers of adult lanternflies feeding on these large tree of heaven. This was on the edge of somebody's lawn. And then she took me to a vineyard. And the picture on the right is a picture of um, a post at the end of the rows of a vineyard. And those masses are egg masses from spotted lanternfly. And I said, wow, this looks like it might be a problem. And it kind of reminds me of something. It kind of reminds me of something that happened here, as you probably all remember, in 2010, where we had that explosive outbreak um, from brown marmorated stink bug. And so at that point, I committed to start working on this project with her team. So to sort of get our heads wrapped around this new invasive species, and we typically do this, we try to learn from the native range and other places it may have invaded. And so we looked at reports from China as well as South Korea. And so the first thing to know about lanternfly is that it is a, a phloem feeder. It feeds on plant sap. Um, it has piercing sucking mouth parts, that long straw-like uh, mouth part that you see. And based on the reports that were from um, South Korea in particular, we were concerned that this insect could become a serious pest of timber, of ornamental trees, as well as tree fruits such as peaches and apples, as well as grapes and hops. So this was sort of helping us guide um, where we might place our efforts. The other piece of information came from, at least for me, from a meeting that I was able to attend in South Korea just before the pandemic. And um, I got to meet with some of the scientists who were involved with the spotted lanternfly research there when um, this bug invaded. And so uh, two of the crops that stood out to us in terms of what they were telling us were major impacts included grapes. And so there was a display at the meeting I was attending talking about the impact that spotted lanternfly was having on their wine industry. Um, they were feeding on the grapevines, causing wilting and stunting and fungal problems, so it wasn't good. And the other was this interesting observation we made. They took us to the Seoul Arboretum, and in the center of the Arboretum, there was this cluster of Manchurian walnut trees. And you can see that they have dieback and decline, and there were actually lanternflies still trying, well, they were dead, but they were, they were fed in place until they died over the winter. And so we think that the feeding, the intense feeding for multiple years was causing a decline. So we were pretty concerned. However, there was also this observation that was kind of encouraging. And that was that when lanternfly first arrived in South Korea, we see this typical rise in the population that you see with um, invasive species as they spread and they have exponential growth. But then, between 2012 and 2018, the population just crashed. Um, they aren't sure why. They think it's a biological control agent. I was like, well, I'd like that biological control agent. So, um, you know, we're trying to learn as much as we can. And by the way, this, this uh, Art piece on the side was made by one of the technical staff of one of the scientists. Those are, that piece is made out of wing parts from spotted lanternfly. She had so many she was working with the lab, she wanted to do something creative. So, <laughs> so there it is. So at any rate, we took all this information and this really, um, really were our, you know, what guided us to um, the topics that we began to work on. So. What I'm gonna talk about tonight are a number of things, and it's really what we have learned so far. I'll talk a little bit about their biology, ecology, and behavior, some of the host plants they're utilizing, and this includes the crops that are at risk, some of the factors associated with their spread and invasion into new regions, 
as well as long-term sustainable management through biological control, and a few conclusions and what we can all do to help. So I'll begin a little bit with the life history. So um, spotted lanternfly right now is overwintering in nature in the form of eggs in these egg masses. These egg masses were probably laid anywhere from September, October, even into November. They will remain in those eggs, and then they will begin to hatch in early spring. We see them here as early as late April, but the bulk of hatch occurs in May and early June. There are three nymphal instars that are black with white spots. They're pretty conspicuous. Then that we have a fourth instar nymph um, that is red with um, white spots and black stripes. This then molts to the adult. They eventually mature, mate, and lay eggs again. Now, when you're looking for them in nature, um, there are some um, species that look similar, and I'll take you through a series of pictures, but um, once you get uh, familiar with what they look like, and unfortunately, I think we're all becoming more familiar with what they look like, um, they're pretty conspicuous. But there are some moth species that look similar, um, as well as some bug species too. So what I'm gonna do is take you through each life stage and I'm gonna start with the eggs. Um, so these are newly laid egg masses and when they lay their egg masses starting in mid-September, um, they are laid in those rows, as you can see, where they're uncovered. What happens then is the female then puts this kind of waxy, tacky material, it almost feels like silly putty over them to protect them and um, they remain there until the following spring. Um, over time, that material dries out and it looks more like a bit of mud as you see here with these unhatched eggs and the protective coating, but it begins to get really flaky and as the um, bugs hatch from the eggs, it really starts to flake off and then you'll just see the rows of eggs. Now, these egg masses each can um, have between 30 and 50 eggs per egg mass, and a female can lay up to five egg masses we've found so far, so that's a lot of eggs. It is, yeah. So uh, what do they look like when they first hatch? So those little white guys there are the first in star nymphs before their exoskeleton has hardened off or sclerotized. Um, the way they hatch, you can see that little um, what I, I like to call the trap door, it's referred to as an operculum that they push out and they pop out of those eggs and they'll remain around that egg mass for about a day. Then they harden, their exoskeleton hardens, they become black with white spots. And so then we have these early nymphal instars, these first through third instars. They have black bodies and legs with white spots. They're between about a quarter to a half inch long. And the thing that's really surprising, and it surprised me a lot the first time I interacted with them in nature, is that they're strong jumpers. I mean, they really can jump far. Now, the early instar nymphs can feed on a broad range of host plants, anything from Virginia creeper to poison ivy to um, all sorts of herbaceous weeds, they'll feed on wild grape, all kinds of things. And they tend to feed on tender growth of, uh, tender new growth of the plants, simply because their mouth parts aren't that long. Um, then when they molt uh, to the fourth instar, this is when you see the red bodies with the black stripes and white spots. They're about a half inch long, a little bit bigger. Again, strong jumpers. And at this point, we start to see their host range narrow, so there are fewer plants that they seem to be feeding on. They seem to be more selective at this stage. When we get to the adult stage, um, they're about an inch long. They can fly as well as jump. Their, their wings are completely um, developed. Females tend to be larger than males, and females have that little red tuft at the tip of their abdomen. You can see the one we're holding between our fingers, um, and that's how you can tell the difference. Um, and their host range narrows even further. There's fewer um, host plants that they'll feed on. Now, when they first molt, um, the adults have to undergo a period of maturation, and especially for the females, they undergo this really intense feeding period, and basically they bulk up. And you can see the yellow abdomen becomes larger and larger. Um, and as this happens, they're able to then start mating and laying eggs. And so if you wanna see what, uh, what happens when they mate, uh, that is a male doing a courtship dance around the female with his little fluttery dance. And so hopefully she finds it acceptable and then they will mate. And um, after that, the female starts laying eggs again. 
And so we have the process beginning again. Now, as I mentioned, um, their host range from the time they're young instar nymphs to the times they're adult, it narrows. And so that means they have to move around to different plants. And so we started thinking a lot about, well, what does their dispersal capacity look like? How far can they move? Because if they start invading crops, we kind of need to know how far they might move. So some of our early experiments were very simple. We looked at things like how far can each life stage climb? So we use these very simple clear tubes where you can put an insect at the bottom and over 15 minutes measure how far it can climb. And the really cruel thing that we do is when they get to the top of the tube, we just reverse it and they keep climbing up. So they just keep going like that. So a nymph, it was interesting, a nymph, even the uh, second instar nymph, they, were cl they climbed between two and eight meters or yards, which is pretty far in 15 minutes. And they have a natural tendency to climb up what was interesting, the adults, which are intensely feeding as they're maturing, very little movement, but um, still, m they were still moving a bit. The other thing we looked at was their jumping capacity of just how far in a single jump could they move. Now, oftentimes, these, this jumping behavior is associated with trying to get away with some, from some sort of threat, but still, it's a dispersal mechanism. We found in these studies, and this was our platform, there you can see our um, where we would measure how far a single individual, you can kind of tap it from behind and get it to jump. Nymphs can jump easily over 20 inches, whereas adults, if you've ever encountered one of them, they can uh, jump as far as eight feet in a single jump, which is pretty far. The other way they can get around, at least the adults, is flight. And unfortunately, we still don't understand all of the triggers for their flight. We know that it depends on their maturity level, on their food availability and the weather conditions. And so far, distances between 75 and 650 feet for a single bout of flight have been measured, but we don't know how far they may go and how far they may go if they make longer flights. So this is still something we're trying to learn more about. But the bottom line is when we look at all of these behaviors, it's clear that we have a highly mobile invasive pest that could threaten agriculture. So this led to the work that we began to conduct on the host plants that they might be using here in the US, including the crops that might be at risk. So when we think about their feeding, again, these guys are phloem feeders. They're feeding on the sap within the plant. And when they do a lot of that intense feeding, it can cause wilt and dieback of the plant. But it also leaves behind excessive honeydew. Honeydew is essentially their excrement, which is very sugary, sticky, watery stuff that causes that terrible sooty mold uh, fungal growth on plants and that reduces um, photosynthesis and if it gets on fruit, it's a problem. So that's a problem. The other thing is that honeydew also attracts wasps, because you can imagine it's a great sugary meal. Wasps, ants, and other insects leading to other issues. And so one of the things that we're thinking about with this is, could this source of honeydew that's out here provide extra food for things like yellow jackets and lead to increases in yellow jacket populations? That's something we're gonna try to look at next year. But this, this kind of feeding, as you can see, has really been done in wild host habitat. But then some, we started to make observations where large numbers started showing up in vineyards and in orchards. And so this is when we became very concerned um, about what impacts they could be having. So we went back to our reports from China and South Korea. And of course, these same species were on there, walnut, maple, grape, apple, peach, locust. And so this led to the first trial that we conducted with lanternfly and host plants, asking the question, what host plants can spotted lanternfly survive on for a two week period? If you gave them one plant and they had to feed on that only, could they survive? Because this is a quarantine pest, we had to do all of this work in a greenhouse, a quarantine greenhouse at Fort Detrick in Frederick, Maryland. And what we did was to introduce either early in star nymphs, late in star nymphs or adults and allow them to feed. And our first set of hosts that we identified, and this was a collaborative project with the US Forest Service as well as Virginia Tech, 
We looked at Tree of Heaven, the invasive plant that we know they feed on, as well as some of our common hardwood species like black cherry, black walnut, and black locust. We also looked at common hackberry, sugar maple, and white oak and mulberry, and then we put in apple and peach. And so we left them for two weeks, we checked them and looked at survivorship. And over the course of this experiment, a couple of things were very clear. First of all, the green bar is, well, the, 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 this is showing survivorship, and the green bar is survivorship on Tree of Heaven. And you can see that about 80% of all life stages survived on that. But for early instar and sort of late instar nymphs, they could feed on a number of different hosts. They didn't survive that well on most of them, but they still could. Whereas the adults, the only thing that really supported their survivorship was Tree of Heaven. So a lot of these hosts don't look that great, like oak, sugar maple, apple, and peach. That looks like they're not good hosts, which is good. Um, but still, we had to confirm a little bit further. So another type of experiment we did, and I'm just showing you one of them, where, is where we tried to see if they could complete their development from the time they hatch from the eggs to the adult stage. We would give them diets. And again, this was done in quarantine. And we gave them either single host diets of tree of heaven, black walnut, apple, peach, or muscadine grape, or we gave them mixed diets of tree of heaven paired with one of those plants. And what we found in this case was that tree of heaven, again, a great host, they survive very well. The mixed diets, they survived pretty well because tree of heaven was in there. <laughs> Excuse me, but interestingly, the, the mixed diets, they actually developed faster, which was kind of interesting. And then black walnut, we did see them complete development. Apple, gr the muscadine grape, and peach never, never could get past the nymphal stages. So that was good. So it looks like these plants are not good hosts. But we were getting these kind of reports from um, some of the early invasions into Pennsylvania vineyards, where you can see lanternflies feeding, they're excreting honeydew. And some of the um, vineyard owners um, from the first invasion, what they were seeing is following this heavy feeding, they were seeing yield losses up to 90%. And they were also seeing increased susceptibility to winter injury. So we had done one species of, of grape. We need to look at other species and see how well they could survive. So we did that same kind of experiment, but in this case with just different grape species. So we compare development and survivorship on Tree of Heaven, on two types of wine grapes, Vitus vinifera on Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, Labrusca, which is um, a juice grape, Riparia, which is a wild river grape, something we would find in the environment, and the Muscadines. Again, Muscadines, they don't do well. Unfortunately, they do quite well on wine grapes. And so definitely wine grapes are at risk. Riparia, the wild grape, also supports their development. So that's another host that they can use in the wild to complete their development. And so knowing this, we kind of have come to the conclusion at this point that this is really a landscape level pest. This means that they can not only be feeding and reproducing in native and invasive woody hosts outside crop production areas, but also attacking vulnerable crops like wine grapes. So knowing that, we have to think about, well, what is the threat across the country and where can these insects invade and establish? So there have been a number of studies that have predicted where they might establish. And so the eastern US for sure, as well as the west coast. And obviously the west coast has a lot of great production and so they are very concerned. The other thing we see is that their invasion seems to be following um, transportation corridors. You can see that invasion follows the I-81 corridor. It also goes across where the Pennsylvania Turnpike and other major interstates as well as rail lines. So this got us thinking, well, how does SLF spread and invade new reagents? Could it be hitching a ride? These are some photos we took in Winchester of individuals sitting on the railway track and some railroad cars just waiting for their hookup. So obviously it seems like this is possible. So we started to dig into this a little deeper in different life stages. And I'm gonna start first with eggs. Eggs are probably how they got here. And it was what we refer to as human assisted transport. They were laid on something and humans transported it somewhere else. 
Unfortunately, these guys will lay their eggs on just about anything. This is a lamp post, some rusty metal, an old barrel, um, concrete blocks, you name it. And so when people move, if they're, if they're not aware, they may be able to transport them. They also lay them on the surfaces of bark. This is a silver maple with large numbers of um, egg masses on the left, but on the right, um, the egg masses were laid on a dead ash tree, and what the lanternfly did, they got under the bark, and these were completely concealed. You would not have known they were there unless you peeled it off, and this is uh, what we refer to as invasional meltdown, when unfortunately, emerald ash borer, one invasive, made a great opportunity for another invasive spotted lanternfly. So eggs are definitely one way that, are, that it, they are getting around through human-assisted transport. But the other is probably through the nymphs and adults hitchhiking. And we have lots of reports anecdotally of this. Um, there was a, um, a tweet post with a, a, an adult riding on a tour bus and it was able to hang on until they hit 40 miles an hour or something. And if you go to the Pennsylvania Turnpike, you'll see these posters to check your vehicles. And of course, we've seen them ourselves. But again, this is all anecdotal. So we wanted to quantify this. And this, is, this was something that my former postdoc, Joanna Elsenson, really wanted to dig into. And so we wanted to build a bioassay to measure the potential for spotted lanternfly to hitchhike. So how do we do this? Well, the first thing you do is you call your engineers. And so um, our engineering staff, Amy Tab and Scott Wolfer, developed this laminar flow fan that would simulate what it was like if the car were moving. Then you put the lantern flies on there and you measure how long they can hang on at different wind speeds. And so this was our bioassay. And on the right, you can see the lantern fly clinging to the hood of the car. And oops, there it goes. Um, but we created this bioassay and we um, measured their ability to adhere or when they were dislodged on um, all the different life stages and all the different um, locations you see on the car, the windshield wipers, the windshield itself, the window well, the hood, and the side panel, at least to start. <clears throat> and so from this work, what we found was, um, unfortunately, they can definitely hitch a ride. Um, all life stages were able to adhere at the highest wind speeds, in this case, we were using about 65 miles an hour on some locations, particularly when they're in the window well, not surprising, or on the windshield wipers. And so what this tells us is that, yes, we can be transporting them ourselves. And so how do we um, deal with that? Um, the best thing to do is really to mitigate the risk through outreach and education. And so our university partners have done a great job with this. Um, they've developed checklists for people who are moving to look in all these different places. I mean, for goodness sake, they were on cushions on somebody's deck, you know, old tires, whatever. So really, before you move, look for these guys. The other thing is that there are programs if, say, shipments of goods are leaving a quarantine zone, they have um, programs that some of the folks that are transporting, they have to they have to learn about how to check their vehicle and the, and the goods and have this permit to move them outside that quarantine zone. So all of this, I think, has helped a lot be, um, slow the spread because it has been 10 years since this insect has been in the country. So that's human-assisted transport. The other way they might be getting around, though, is natural adult movement. Um, you know, adults can fly, um, and we've seen them flying long distances. And one of the things that we've been noticing is that what seems to happen is when they tap out a local area where they've really fed on these plants intensely for a couple of years, they start flying longer distances, we think, and looking probably for a better resource. So on the left, the, these are happy lanternflies. They're just kind of sitting there feeding. But on the right, like those Manchurian walnuts, n wouldn't have made them very happy. And when these dispersal flights happen, we often see them on human-made structures, which is kind of interesting. And so here's some examples um, that my former postdoc, Jim Hepler, took. This includes our water tower at the lab this past summer. And you can see that just the numbers that were orienting to that upright structure. So that kind of led to this question, can we see a difference in the diets of these dispersing lanternflies who are looking for something better to eat 
versus the sedentary guys that are just sitting on tree of heaven happily feeding away. So um, we ended up doing um, some work, which I like to refer as my CSI um, projects, where we tried to see if there were differences between these dispersing and sedentary spotted lanternfly diets by collecting the DNA from their guts, we dissected them, and basically looked for the plant DNA by amplifying it and sequencing it and then identifying any plants that were in, in, in that um, sample. And so uh, Jim did this for dispersing SLF collected on human-made structures and sedentary. And what he found was that the dispersers had some interesting um, things that the, we think were probably sampling along the way as they were looking for something better. Things like goldenrod and mugwort and pokeweed whereas the um, sedentary had things that we knew that they typically would feed on. They both had Tree of Heaven, Grape, and Virginia Creeper, but in all likelihood, these were sources that were tapped out or too crowded, so these dispersers, we think, moved on to look for something better. So we know they're moving. The next question, of course, is how do you monitor for their presence? So in this case, um, the original monitoring trap for spotted lanternfly was this sticky band, and you may have seen these around. Um, they do work um, because the bugs have a natural tendency to climb up, but they also capture a lot of non-targets, and that we don't like. And so my lab, along with my colleagues at Penn State, we developed some different trap designs that we hope would capture lanternflies, but reduce those non-target captures. So these were circle trap design, which are basically a skirt that fits around the tree. It, um, the bugs climb in and it funnels them into those collection devices. And so we did this work over two years, asking the question if these would be better trap designs. And what we found was that yes, these circle traps are much better. Um, they reduce the non-target captures by 50%, and you can see the kind of non-target captures we're hoping to avoid. But there is one weakness, and that is they are not very effective when spotted lanternflies are rare. So um, something to think about. Now, if you're wanting to get rid of spotted lanternflies around your house, you can make your own spotted lanternfly removal trap. There's a nice how-to on Penn State's extension website where you make the circle trap, but in this case, you have a removable bag that you can then throw them away and um, at least get rid of some of them on your um, property. Now, that's trapping, but again, we don't know if um, under low pressure or, or under rare populations if they're present. And so one of the things that um, we've worked on with our colleagues at Rutgers is the idea of environmental DNA. The DNA left behind by foraging spotted lanternflies, either in their honeydew, their uh, footsteps. And so this is a, another one of our little CSI projects where basically you look for spotted lanternfly DNA in, in the environment. And you can do this by essentially giving a tree a bath you take that rinse water from the tree and you concentrate it through a special filter that captures all the DNA, and then you can take it through the extraction and amplification process and look to see if you actually have spotted lanternfly DNA in your sample. And this potentially can help you determine if they are present, even when you aren't finding them with other survey methods. So we said, well, let's try this at the lab. Um, so I'm gonna give you a timeline of trials that we conducted um, with uh, different sampling techniques. So in 2019, this was the first year that we had them locally, and um, we found one dead spotted lanternfly in our parking lot. The other thing we did in 2019 was we planted a vineyard in anticipation that lanternflies were gonna show up and we were gonna do research with them. Now there was nothing in our vineyard, just one dead lanternfly. In 2020, working with Rutgers, we decided to go ahead and do these environmental DNA samples, and so we gave a lot of trees some baths, and we also put out our monitoring traps, and we did visual surveys. The eDNA samples at the end of the summer were positive, 
the trap samples and the visual samples, we saw nothing and the vineyard had nothing. And I thought, oh, this eDNA, it doesn't even work. This is just pretend, you know. But the next year I was wrong, of course. And um, we had positive eDNA samples and we were also finding them in our traps and in our visual surveys. So the eDNA, the very little DNA being left by these insects when they're very rare, well, you can pick it up and it gives you an advanced warning and possibly an opportunity to prepare or even um, do something more um, toward eradication. Now by 2022, we had them everywhere. Um, they were all over um, and we didn't bother sampling. And unfortunately in 2023, they infested our vineyard and they are at numbers of over 100 per vine. Um, which is very damaging. So we're going to be doing experiments to try to manage them sustainably. But at the bottom line is we have to think about how to manage this pest across the landscape. And so when we think about managing an invasive species like spotted lanternfly, we talk about biological control. And usually it's not just one biocontrol agent, it's a whole army. And so I'm just gonna share with you some of the different categories of natural enemies we have that we're hoping will help reduce populations of lanternfly, much like we've seen with brown marmorated stink bug. So to begin with, we do have native natural enemies. We have birds that are consuming them. You can see praying mantids and other generalist predators. And my undergrads in my lab um, are currently doing spider surveys to understand what groups of spiders are most effective. And what they've seen so far is that funnel weavers and orb weavers are quite effective at um, tackling some of the lantern flies. So th this group is having some impact, but certainly not to the point where we're seeing um, a complete reduction. So then we start talking about things like classical biological control where you have insects that evolved with the invasive pest, but back in the native range. So it's kind of like, you know, being paired with your greatest enemy. Now in this case, because these are non-native as well, we can't just release them in the environment. So it takes a lot of research and you have to go through a regulatory process to ensure that if we release these um, um, parasitoids in this case, they wouldn't attack our natives. And so there are two species or two groups that we're looking at. Anastatus orientalis, which is a non-stinging parasitic wasp that lays its eggs in the eggs of um, spotted lanternfly. And then um, this Dryanus species, which is really weird, it attacks the nymphs and it lays its egg up under the developing wing pad. And then if you can see at the bottom, that white ball, that's actually the pupa about to burst out of the side of the spotted lanternfly. So it's a pretty gruesome death for the lanternfly. But these are the species that we found in China that may improve our ability to reduce the population. Still a lot of research going on with my colleagues, both in Delaware and in Massachusetts. These are in quarantine. Other opportunities we have? Um, entomopathogenic nematodes. These are microscopic roundworms that attack particular species of insects. And what they do is they enter the host as what we call infective juveniles. They release symbiotic bacteria in the insect. It causes septicemia and the insect dies. And then all the roundworms kind of, you know, leak out again and can infect others. So, We've done evaluations with several species and strains, and so far they're not good against the eggs, they're not good against the latter uh, older nymphs or the adults, but the early and star nymphs, we've seen reductions up to 44% in their survivorship. So this is something else that um, may provide us with a tool to help manage them more sustainably across a landscape. And then finally, um, we found this um, in 2018, if you guys remember, it was a very rainy summer. Um, during that summer, there were natural infections of this entomopathogenic fungal species known as Bovaria bassiana. And so essentially, it turns them into little pom-pom puffballs and kills them. And so it's very effective against nymphs and adults. And this is something else that um, I have a, I'm on a, a PhD students committee at Virginia Tech we're looking at as another more sustainable method to manage these insects. So 
With that, I just want to say that um, the research on spotted lanternfly continues. We still have many questions that we're trying to address as a national team. But I will say that things you can do to help, feel free to obliterate, obliterate the eggs. You can scrape them with like an old hotel key or something. Nymphs and adults feel free to squash them or even apps that you can um, download and play games with other people. Who, can you squish the most lanternflies? And also, uh, true. <laughs> and also just check your uh, belongings. Don't take them with you. And so I wanna show you a video, but I'm giving you a disclaimer before I play it. So when we were doing this work with the um, vehicle, um, the modelers that were working with in Temple, they said, well, um, if they're blown off the vehicle and they hit another windshield behind them, do they survive? So we had to come up with a bioassay for that. So I'm just going to show you the video. If you don't want to watch it, close your eyes now. Close your, close your eyes now. Okay, here we go. So what happens when a lanternfly hits um, a windshield? A lot of times they actually survive. And it really depends on how they hit. You can see that one's sort of twirling away. Um, in our studies, we found that most of them survive. So if you take them on your vehicle, and even if they're blown off and hit another car, they still may be able to colonize a new area. So try to not take them with you. That's the answer to that. Okay. With that, I want to thank all of you for coming out and listening to this talk. I want to thank my current lab group. They're fantastic, as well as former technical staff and postdocs who have been part of this project since 2018. I want to thank my funding sources, and I want to thank PVAS and uh, Friends of NCTC for inviting me to talk to all of you tonight. Thank you so much.